Uh, I will take questions at the end of the webinar, yes, but I will also take them during the webinar. So if you have anything you'd like to ask along the way, please chat in. Manny will hold the questions and then I will invite them. Okay, here we go. 10 crushing business writing mistakes and how to avoid them. Let me introduce myself briefly. I am an ASQ member. I think this is year three of my membership. So I'm a relatively new um, member. I would consider myself, uh, let's see, quality curious. <laughs> I'm not a trained quality professional, but I have worked a great deal in the customer service and contact center world, in the manufacturing world, in the government uh, service world. And so I consider myself uh, like a cousin <laughs> to, to quality and uh, glad to be in the ASQ family now. Uh, my name again is Leslie. My last name is Oflahaven. My company is called eWrite. That's E hyphen W-R-I-T-E. So you know, by the hyphen that I formed this company a long time ago, back when we used to use the hyphen after the E. I'm the owner of the company. I formed it in 1996. And our uh, simple mission is to help people learn to write well at work. We are a writing training consultancy. And as I said, our job is to help people in all walks of work write well so they can connect with their readers effectively and they can save time for themselves and for their readers. I'm a plain language expert, I'm an author, and I'm a writing instructor. In the center of this slide, uh, I'm just showing you the kind, the truly remarkable range of companies I've been lucky enough to work with. Everyone from Bear, the uh, pharmaceutical manufacturer, to Caterpillar, the manufacturer of heavy equipment, to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I worked with them this morning, to the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. I've been to Abu Dhabi twice to work with ADIA, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, which is the sovereign wealth fund of Abu Dhabi. So it's a strange and wonderful and broad work life I've had the good fortune to enjoy. On the right hand side of the slide, as I wanted to let you know, I am a LinkedIn learning author of six different writing courses. And if your company doesn't offer access to LinkedIn learning courses as, as part of a training package, if you are in the US, you can get free access to all LinkedIn learning courses through your public library account. If you log in online, you can get access that way. So if you're interested in LinkedIn learning training, my, my courses or anyone's, you can take those courses for free. So here are the topics for our brief webinar today. I'm going to show you 10 common crushing business writing mistakes. I will always use real world examples of business writing. And so when I show you these mistakes, I will show you real world, real live examples. And of course, I'm going to help you learn how to avoid making these business writing mistakes. No one wants to attend a webinar on, on how to be wrong. <laughs> that's, that's not what we're about. This is a webinar on how to avoid making uh, writing mistakes that will crush your ability to convey your message or to gain the results you're hoping for. Are you ready? Here we go. On these two slides, I'm going to quickly show you the 10 mistakes I'll cover. And I'm thinking that between number one and number 10, you might see one of your own challenges. So here are some business writing mistakes, the first five that you will, must strive to avoid. Number one, don't put your main point at the end. No one will see it. Number two, don't use technical terms your readers don't know. If you must use technical terms to retain the technical accuracy of your writing, make sure you explain the terms. Maybe you give an example of the term. Maybe you use a metaphor to show what the term means. Make sure your readers understand the technical terms. Number three, don't put your needs ahead of your readers needs. The nicest thing we can say about anyone's writing the most exalted compliment is that their writing is reader focused, focused on the reader's needs. Number four, 
don't use cheesy business jargon that's lost its meaning. We, we don't ever need to think outside the box again. We don't need to drink from the fire hose anymore. That's beneath you. That kind of writing is just corny. Number five, failing to proofread. Every, every writing teacher you've had since elementary school has been reminding you to proofread, and I'm reminding you also. Next, number six, don't write what I am nicknaming wall of text paragraphs. One way that business writing has changed over the last generation is that readers expect shorter paragraphs. They don't want to read paragraphs that fill half a page or more. And even if you don't change the content of a long paragraph, you will be better off if you break it into smaller pieces. Readers expect paragraphs and they enjoy paragraphs of five sentences or six sentences, but not these giant walls of text. Number seven, don't write vague hyperlinks. And though some of you may not uh, have to write hyperlinks very often. Number seven, point number seven will be about why we don't write click here as the hyperlink language. Number eight, don't use bullets when numbers would help your reader more. Number nine, don't write overly long sentences and I will be specific about how long is too long. And finally, don't hold this old idea that it's wrong to refer to the reader as you. It isn't wrong to refer to the reader as you, and when you refer to your reader as you, you can connect with your reader in an excellent way. Okay, so 10 crushing business writing mistakes, and I promise you that it will be my job to talk about how to avoid these mistakes. We'll see examples, and then we'll learn about how to avoid them. Are you ready? Here we go. So here's the first example, and I will tell you what we're looking at for a moment, and then I'm going to be quiet and give you some time to read it. I know you're looking at this slide and you're groaning. You're thinking, oh, I don't want to read all that. And believe me, the people who received this email didn't want to read all that either. Let me tell you what this is, and then I'll be quiet so you can read. This is an email, a real email, though the names have been changed, the name of the writer, the name of the company, I've changed those names. It's an email from Mike Mansfield, whose title is Facility Supervisor at a company I called Prime Products. And he's writing an all staff email. So everyone in the company is going to receive this and he hopes everyone in the company will read it. You can see his subject line is temperature control. So I'm gonna set the timer on my phone and give you a, a about a minute of peace and quiet. You go ahead and read this. I'll be quiet. So those of you who in the future are listening to the recording, don't worry, nothing's broken. I'm just being quiet. You go ahead and read. Okay, the timer has just gone off, and though you may not have been highly motivated to read this email, I hope you did read this email. This email breaks my heart. <laughs> this email makes me want to grab a tissue and wipe the tears from my eyes because Mike Mansfield has a clear message. He has a clear and direct point he, there is something, in fact, he expects his readers of this email to do, but he's made a dreadful mistake and he has put the main message last. Uh, if, if we were together, we could easily discuss what is Mike's main message. In my reading, his main message is that anyone who works for Prime Products who has a space heater or a fan needs to get rid of it 
by September 1st or to turn it over for donation by September 1st because space heaters and fans are not allowed in this building. When people use space heaters and fans, it throws off the thermostat and makes their temperature control, the company's temperature control problems worse. But because Mike has put his main message last, he's basically, he's writing, a, he's creating the funeral for his hopes that people will read it. To have to wade through this much writing, this much detail, this much around and around the main point before you get to the main point. Most readers just won't do this. They just won't try this hard and I don't think they should have to. So the first crushing business writing mistake is putting your main point in the wrong place as Mike Mansfield has done. Whatever else he writes, his main point needs to be near the beginning. Here's my rewrite of Mike's email. I did this version and I hope you like it a lot better. First thing I want you to notice is that I put, excuse me, I put the main point in the subject line. So now the subject line, instead of reading temperature control, which is what it said before, now it says policy reminder, remove space heaters from work areas by September 1. Because the main point is in the subject line, some people won't have to read the email at all. If you don't have a space heater or a fan in your office, you don't have to read the email at all, and that's a wonderful thing. The next thing I did to expose the main point is I wrote a short paragraph at the beginning that summarizes the entire email. So if people uh, do open the email, they read the subject line, they open the email, if they read the first paragraph only, they get the main point. And so by investing less effort, readers gain more value because the main point is at the beginning. Then I hope you notice that I added headings to the various sections of the email because this kind of an email just, sorry, just doesn't look modern. It doesn't look modern and it doesn't look motivating to read. I added headings so people could see the sections, I added lists within the section headings so people could uh, see the different points and I made the amount of effort that this email requires a lot less. Okay, first crushing writing mistake, put the main message last, much better practice, put the main message first. Let's go on. Here is uh, crushing business writing mistake number two, using technical terms readers don't know. Now, I'm well aware you can't see this letter well enough to read this on this screen. I just wanted to show it to you first and then I'm going to uh, make it, it'll be presented larger so you can read it. I found this uh, letter online by Googling. So anyone who has fingers and Google can find this letter also. This is a letter from a health insurer, Mass Health, Massachusetts Health, and it is was sent to all members, everyone who uh, holds this health insurance policy back in May 2016. So the recipients or anyone who has this type of policy, so when we think about using technical terms readers do or don't know, we have to think about the technical savvy of the people who will receive or read the communication. Let me show this to you in an easier to read size. Here is the letter and I, uh, I know most of us feel discouraged or defeated anytime we get communications from a health insurance company. In this case, the technical language in this letter would make readers, dis uh, members, discouraged and defeated and confused. So the letter begins, our records show that you and or someone in your household, that's already vague, have mass health and another health insurance that mass health refers to as comprehensive third party health insurance, which I underlined. Taken one at a time, comprehensive, that's not a technical term, third party, kind of. Taken together, this is a technical term many readers won't know. And as you, it continues, with this third party health insurance, you can no longer remain enrolled in a mass health managed care plan. So now we have two uh, 
health insurance product names or technical terms that readers might not know. And the content is getting scary because we're, we're, the letter is telling us you can't remain enrolled. Something that you had is about to end, right? In the third paragraph, there isn't too much technical language that readers won't know. But as the letter continues in the section, this change will not affect your mass health coverage as long as you continue to meet all mass health eligibility requirements. Now I'm completely confused because in the second and third paragraph, you seem to be telling me that I am not covered anymore. I can't remain enrolled. And now you're telling me that I can stay covered as long as I meet eligibility requirements. The following paragraph includes uh, the term fee-for-service program. And again, this is not defined in the letter. So this, a letter like this, this letter in particular, this really breaks my heart because it's high stakes information. You're losing your health insurance. And it's this letter is going to a lot of people and they differ from each other. And this letter is going to make things worse for the company because confused people write back. <laughs> confused people call in and people who receive this letter will be confused. Now, I know your work includes using a lot of technical terms that your readers sometimes do know and that they also sometimes don't know. So I want to summarize some of the findings from this research study that was published, that was uh, uh, described in Nature, the journal Nature. And I think I find this research study really fascinating. So the researchers studied technical language in science articles. Now, the, the mass health letter isn't a science article, and you may not write science articles, but the findings from this research study are relevant for people who write other types of products. The find, this research study stud, uh, found that overly technical language in science articles alienates readers. We, we can understand that. And it shuts them out of scientific discussion and knowledge. Let me tell you how the study, how they did this study. In the study, they gathered 650 people they referred to as general public, and they gave them paragraphs on technical topics, including self-driving cars, robotic surgery, and 3D bioprinting. And in these uh, paragraphs, some people got paragraphs that were laden with technical jargon, terms such as remote ergonomic console, and some people got paragraphs that were laid in, that were written in familiar words. So they didn't use remote ergonomic console. They use separate control panel. Okay. The, the outcome, this is not going to surprise anyone. The people who read the jargon filled paragraphs were more likely to say they had difficulty understanding. That seems pretty obvious to me and probably seems pretty obvious to you. But this finding matters a lot. The people who read the jargon-filled paragraphs said they themselves weren't good at science and they were less likely to seek out information on that same topic in the future. So what I want you to see is when the jargon or the technical terms are more complex than your readers understand, yes, they felt they can't understand very well, but that technical language harms their willingness to read information on that same topic in the future. It makes them think things like, I'm not good at science, or I'm never good at understanding the letters from my health insurance company. When you confuse your readers by overly technical jargon once, you pay a price in future communications also. You, you damage their motivation. And that is a high price to pay. Imagine mass health paying that high price. So here is my rewrite of the mass health letter to members. And I, I, at the top of the slide, it says one of two because I spread this out over two slides so that you could see it well enough. Now, I don't know if mass health would like this. Their letter came out six years ago. It seems like ancient history, but I think my version is a lot easier to read. You can see that I use personal pronouns. We are reaching out because our records show that you, so that's one way to, um, manage the technical complexity is to offset technical complexity with a personal connection. 
when I used comprehensive third-party health insurance, because it's the technically accurate term, I put it in quotation marks to show that is in that it is a technical term, and then I continued a policy from a different provider. This is in the third line, ABC Health Insurance. So I gave more context, more explanation, so they would understand. I made it clear the outcome of this letter is we're ending your coverage on April 23rd, 2016. And I explained what fee for service is down at the bottom of this page. With this fee for service program, you will pay the Mass Health provider directly for each service, such as a test, etc. So I explained the technical terms in the context, in the flow of the sentence. Here's the rest of the letter. The headings are longer. My headings are longer. I wrote how to appeal our decision to end your enrollment. They had just written appeal. I think they wrote notice of appeal. Um, and I explained what disenrollment is by using the words end your enrollment. How to contact Mass Help. Mass Health for Help is also a longer heading. So I hope that this before and after example shows you how to manage technical jargon without replacing it. If you have to use the jargon to keep your writing accurate, you can use it, but you can't use it if your reader isn't likely to understand it. Okay, number three, putting your needs before your reader's needs. This is a screenshot of an email I received, as you can see the date, uh, January 27th, 2001. I got this from my doctor's office, which I have uh, colored out most of the name, but two, in, two words are from phys PA, Physicians Associates. This is a terrible and selfish email from my doctor's office. First of all, they address me with the generic dear valued patient. And if you remember January 27, 2000, 2021, everyone who wanted a, va a COVID vaccine was highly anxious about getting one. And they start this email with the sentence, we have been deluged with calls and portal messages asking about the COVID vaccine. Th that is putting their needs before their readers or their customers needs. Please, doctor's office, don't tell me or don't imply that I'm bothering you when I'm asking about when the vaccine will be ready. Second sentence, we know many are anxiously awaiting the vaccine. Underlined, we don't have it. So now we have three sentences and they have yet to explain how they'll try to give people what they so uh, desperately are asking about. They're still describing their own experience of being deluged with calls. In the middle, uh, Physicians Associates has registered with the state of Maryland, but they continue, we're not keeping a waiting list, so that's another not, and we don't know when the vaccine will be made available. So this is a very not and no kind of an email. We don't want to hear from you so much, you're drowning us, we can't answer your question, and we don't know when you'll be able to answer your question. And I consider this a crushing business writing mistake. I don't have anything, uh, a rewrite to offer. I just wanted us all to experience what it sounds like when somebody writes something that's uh, singularly unhelpful. And this is really unhelpful. Don't put your your own needs ahead of your readers needs. Even if you can't answer their questions yet, explain how you'll do your best to answer their questions when you can answer them. Okay, don't use cheesy business jargon that has lost its meaning. Now, I'm going to show you these cheesy business jargon phrases in larger font in just a moment. I just wanted you to see uh, what this looks like here, actually. Let's go back, sorry. Um, this uh, company ran a poll on what is the most annoying business jargon, and these polls come out all the time. Uh, the percentages that 59% of people polled thought giving 110% was the most annoying business jargon. 59% also voted for our ping you. So I'll, now you can see these uh, better, and the percentages have dropped away. Um, I'm not a fan of most of these. Uh, 
I, I don't really want to hear anyone, uh, to read anyone saying reinvent the wheel. Um, I'd rather you contact me than touch base with me. Just, you could contact me, you could email me, you could call me, you could meet with me, but you don't need to touch base with me. And the reason that these uh, business jargon phrases and words are annoying is because they're so incredibly overused. So if you want your writing to be fresh, uh, and to be, uh, I don't know, uh, non-trite, <laughs> you will avoid these business jargon phrases. Now, I'm going to take a deep breath here and invite you to ask any questions. Manny, have any questions come in so far? So, for form letters, what's the suggestion for how to optimize that process on the mass uh, letter? Well, for example, yeah, that's knowing the insurance company may not be able to be added. Okay, um, this, it's not the form letter of it all that makes this bad writing. It's the difficulty in understanding this that makes this bad writing. I, I think uh, yeah. writing one letter that is going to be sent to many, many different people, I think it's possible to do that very well. And you, and uh, I hope, again, I. I can't hold my rewrite up as perfect because uh, Mass Health didn't sign off on it. But I hope that my rewrite shows that form doesn't equal difficult. It needn't equal difficult. In fact, a, a wise and practical health insurance company would want their form letters to be really easy to understand because they're distributed so widely. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, um, somebody else made a comment that said uh, talking about overused phrases when the where the rubber meets the road. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's a good one too. That that should be on this list right here, though it didn't show up in this survey. It should be on this list. I'll go ahead uh, and continue now, and then if other questions come in, I'll be glad to answer. Tell you what, there is one more that just came in, mm -hmm. and um, so the, the yeah. Unfortunately, I'm trying to like make it a full statement or a question. Understand using you mm -hmm. in personal communications is okay. Do you recommend using the same informality for more formal documents? Yes, I do. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, I like the word recommend. I'm not saying it's only correct to use the pronoun you, but I want to open everyone's mind uh, to using all the personal pronouns in as many types of documents as as you can, because uh, even even uh, scholarly articles, some journals publish scholarly articles where the researcher is speaking directly to the reader using the pronoun you. Using the pronouns I, we, and you is one of the most reliable ways to connect with readers it helps answer the abiding question many readers have, which is how, why does this matter to me or how, how, why should I care? So um, in, I'm, I'm certain that some people on this webinar have, write types of documents where they're forbidden to use the pronoun you. I'm certain of that. I know that there are some formal documents where it's simply unacceptable and the editors won't tolerate you using the pronoun you. But between formal published work and emails, there's a ton of other kinds of writing. And I would just, I think it's really practical and effective if you'll open your mind and consider it. Could I address the reader directly? Could I? Have I ever really been forbidden from doing this or did I just assume I'm forbidden? So I would leave your mind open to that. Okay, we go on now and now I'll come back yeah. for questions. Go ahead. Sounds next, great. Next crushing business writing mistake, failing to proofread. I don't need to sell you this one at all. So guess what I did? I went to the ASQ certifications page and I made I added errors. These are all these errors are mine. Okay. Can you find the five errors? Please don't blame ASQ. I made mistakes. I'll be quiet for just a bit. See if you can find them. So the error is failing to proofread. That is the crushing business writing mistake is failing to proofread. Here are the errors. I put two spaces after the period after industries. That's not correct. I wrote your instead of you. 
I wrote you instead of your. I used, uh, I, I omitted the comma after advantage and I spelled the word by, I, I used the wrong spelling of the word by. So uh, every one of us has made proofreading mistakes, including me. <laughs> no one is a perfect proofreader. And yet proofreading is such an important way of making sure mm, that no one gets distracted by superficial errors and misses your main point, which we've been uh, which we've been talking about already. So let me give you uh, five quick tips for proofreading. Proofreading is a tedious task, and we often do it when we're full on sick of what we're writing. So here are some tips. One thing you can do to gain some freshness when you're proofreading is print or choose an unfamiliar font for your writing so that it looks completely different. Choose a font you would never actually use. You could use Comic Sans or something weird. Uh, when, you, when the writing looks a little different, it can help you see it afresh. If you want to check your spelling, read the words in reverse order. That can help you uh, see each word individually, and it might help you catch a spelling error. Number three, co-read with a colleague. If you have, if you and a colleague are working on something that really has to be 100% clean and zero errors in it, you can take turns reading sentence, paragraph, sentence, paragraph, one person reading and the other checking. That's a high effort way to proofread, but if it has to be perfect, it might be worth it. Um, it, number four, you can read one line at a time if you're reading in hard copy, and I highly suggest you read in hard copy when you're proofreading because there's less eye strain and you can also control how much you're seeing. So you read one line at a time and just expose one line by covering the rest with a piece of paper. And then finally, this one takes a lot of self-discipline, and you may not like this tip, but some people do like it. Proofread for one kind of error at a time. That would mean you would read through once for spelling. You would read through once to see if everyone's name is correct. You would read through once to see if all the dates are correct. Then you would read through for grammar. So number five is kind of high effort, but you might find it useful. Okay, next. Crushing business writing mistake number six is writing a wall of text paragraph. This paragraph again comes from the ASQ website and I didn't do anything to this paragraph except copy and paste it. And let me give you just a moment or so, a little, few, a, a little bit of time to read through this and just to feel how long the paragraph is. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, readers' preferences have changed over the last generation, definitely, they have changed. And the reason that reader, one of the reasons readers prefer shorter paragraphs now is, of course, uh, most people read most of the information they read online, and they're reading on devices of all sizes, including this size, and they just uh, find it more helpful to consume written information in smaller units. So there's nothing illogical about this paragraph. The, the information isn't in the wrong order. This is uh, just too big f to uh, motivate people to read in this style, in this day and age. People just aren't motivated. And I don't think you're probably motivated to read this paragraph either. So let me show you an alternative. I wrote I took the same information. I, I just misspoke and said wrote. I took the same information and I simply added white space. I was able to make four slender logical paragraphs from that large paragraph and then I added headings like this. Now the overall topic of this section now is the evolution of quality 4.0 and as you can see I use the clear and strong structure of the big paragraph and I broke it down first industrial revolution second third and fourth okay let me give you a moment to just glance at this and to read this and and I wonder if you like it better what do you think 
If you like it better, let me know in the chat. And Julie says it's easy to lose focus. Much better. There we go. So um, the the I'm reluctant to, to suggest uh, writing fixes that would take an, a tremendous amount of time. But what I've done here didn't take a tremendous amount of time. What I did was I studied the long paragraph. I asked myself, can I simply break this into so shorter sections? And I could. And then I decided to try to give each section a name, and it worked quite well. Good. All right. Those of you who are chatting and are saying you like the shorter ones, I like it too. I like them too. All right, here's the next crushing business writing mistake that I sincerely want you to avoid, and that is writing vague hyperlinks. So the words click here with the hyperlink, with the URL attached to the words click here, these are not good link words. Everyone knows to click a link. You never need to explain that they should click a hyperlink. That's, you, know, you didn't in need to explain it in 1996. You definitely don't need to explain it now. Don't right click here to learn more about reporting insurance claims. Put the hyperlink on the words that matter the most, reporting insurance claims. That's a better hyperlink. Don't write pro help is available to members who carry any form of general liability coverage and then just use the words learn more. Reiterate learn more about pro help because learn more could take me to anything. It could take me to the basics of li general liability coverage. But in fact, it's going to take me to this one product name, Pro Help. Let the hyperlink show that. Don't write um, for additional information on Section 111. Please review this document. That's not very clear. That doesn't help readers as much. Use the hyperlink, review our Medicare reporting document. And the reason we want hyperlink language to carry uh, meaningful information is because clicking a link is like walking through a door. You want people to know where they're going when they walk through the door. They're leaving the content they were reading. They're going to go read new content, make that easy to see and easy to understand. All right. Crushing business writing mistake number eight. Don't use bullets when numbers would help your reader more. Numbers would help your reader more. Now, I got this example from an intranet page uh, for employees, how to edit a travel authorization. And so let me be quiet for a moment while you're reading. And the question is, why would numbers help more? That's the question. When you're ready, pop your answer in the chat. Here we go. These are steps. And we have five or six people answering these are steps. Numbers imply steps, right, Sabrina? And Helen, because they are sequential, and that's just right. So when you are writing steps, you should number them. They need, Scott, they need to be done in a specific order. You should uh, number the step, series of steps in a sequence because not every reader or user needs to read all of them. Some people might know, I already know I need to be logged in. I'll start with step number two, okay? So I, I want to uh, uh, speak a minute about bullets overall. In the maybe thousands of people I will work with in a year in writing courses, uh, many of them say, you know, I, I like writing that's bulletized. I like writing that has bullets. And anymore, they use the word bullet to refer to any way that a writer has helped readers scan the document. So for that reason, bullets, the word bullet or the presence of bullets, it's become a, a proxy for any way that the writer has made the document easier for the reader. And for that reason, you know, people really, really like and count on 
uh, bullets <laughs> to make documents easier for them to read. So when you choose bullets or numbers, make a good and a careful choice. It matters a lot to readers. It's a signifier of whether the document will be easy to read. And so you should make that choice carefully. Okay, here's the same content with numbers and we said we would appreciate them and as you see when you start to number the steps you have more steps than when they were bulleted. The bulleted list is a little bit sloppy. This one is um, more carefully uh, set step after step. All right, don't write overly long sentences. This is not news to you. The sentence on the left, which comes from uh, research into safety practices in coal mines, this is 49 words. 49 words is a lot. 49 words is too long. Um, yes, it is possible to write a well-structured and elegant 49-word sentence, but probably you won't. <laughs> probably it'll just be too long. So please uh, consider the twenties, so, uh, the cap. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to say that there can never be a good 30 word sentence. Of course there could, but I would just say, watch it, watch it. And if you're getting up into 30, 31, 32 words, see if you can make it shorter, see if you can break the sentence into two words. So what I did on the right hand side, I broke this 49 word sentence into a 14 and a 30, and I lost five words along the way. And I'm happy about that. This sentence is too long. In uh, 52 words of glare-induced eye fatigue, no doubt, um, I was able to break this into three sentences, 10 words, 28 words, and 12 words. And let's see, 22. So I, I lost a couple words along the way. I didn't lose a lot, but I lost a little bit. And I think the pattern short, longer, short is also a pleasant pattern to read. Karen says, as a technical writer, I love using action words as the first word in my steps. That's back when we were looking at the number steps. Uh, Sabrina asks, is there ever a reverse time when you should use bullets instead of numbers? Yes, as in, will the numbers confuse the reader if there is not sequencing? Here, let's go back, okay? Yes, you should use bullets when the sequence of the points isn't the most important thing about them. So, for example, if you say, um, People who plan winter camping trips must also purchase specialized equipment. And then it might say camp stove, uh, low temperature rated sleeping bag, and a tent of such and such type. The camp stove, the sleeping bag, and the tent, there's no order there. You, those items could be presented in any order, so you don't need numbers. However, if you wanted to say people who... Uh, go on winter camping tip trips need three specialized items, then you could use numbers in that list because you want to emphasize the number of items they need, three. It's not that they have to buy the first one first or that the first one's more important. It's just that you want to strengthen the sense that there are three of them. Okay. All right. Back into don't write overly long sentences. Okay. Consider yourself scolded. <laughs> and last but not least, point number 10. Consider referring to the reader as you. Take at any appropriate opportunity to refer to the reader as you. Here are a few examples. It's, it's wrong to write applicants can submit their resumes to me or on our career site at salisburyjobs.com if you're talking and writing to applicants if it's a web page and that sentence is on a web page and another person who's not an applicant could read it true but mostly you're writing to applicants use the pronoun you just because someone else might read it still applicants are the main and most important readership use the pronoun you don't write, interested people may request more information or sign up to become a mentor. Why refer in the abstract to interested people when to engage the reader, you're actually better off addressing the reader as you. Okay, here are some takeaways. I'm checking my time here. We're doing great, we'll have time for questions. Strive to make your writing easy to read, obviously. Do the work so your reader won't have to. It's, it's really like a, a seesaw. You do more work so the reader can do less. And please embrace change. If I've told you something 
today that someone in the past about business writing someone in the past told you was forbidden or was too casual you you probably right they probably did tell you that but business writing does change and it's our job to change with it on this slide i'm not going to go through all of this but these are some recommended business writing books. I've recently interviewed author Sarah James, who wrote a book called Writing Better Audit Risk and Compliance and Information Security Reports. So I have a, a YouTube uh, video of my interview with her. Here is my contact information. And now I am opening up the chat to see your questions and to uh, so pop them in. If you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, Wesley wrote, perhaps this is old school, but I disagree on using you, we, or our in any formal communications, regardless of delivery format. Okay, we, we can agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have a question? Anything you'd like to say or ask? Well, there is one um, a little bit earlier about thoughts on the Oxford comma. Yes, so sure. First, you can explain what that is and sure. then maybe give us your thoughts. The Oxford comma is also sometimes called the serial comma. It's the comma after, it's the comma before the end. So here in the chat, I bought uh, milk, comma, milk, comma, bread, comma, and eggs. So in this sentence, there's a comma after the word bread and, and in front of the word and. That's called the Oxford comma. Um, the I don't have I don't I don't care. <laughs> I mean I care, but I want to know what the organization's style guide is, and then I will follow the style guide. Organizations that use the Chicago Manual of Style or the GPO, the Government Printing Office Manual of Style, or um, others use the Oxford comma. Organizations that follow the AP style book, which is what journalists follow, they don't use the Oxford comma. So life is short and then you die. Tell me what your style guide is and I'll follow. Yeah. Um, let's see. Why do some use two spaces after a period? Mike asked. It's a, it's a bad and old habit and you shouldn't do that. Use one space after a period. If you learn two spaces on a period on a typewriter, so did I, so what? Typewriters don't work the way computers and word processors work. Use one space after a period. The word processor will uh, automatically adjust the space between the period and the next capital letter if you use one space. If you use two, it breaks that function. Okay, let's see. Adela asks, is there a time you would consider to use less familiar wording such as you and I, for example, in research and, and investigation? Uh, reporting. Yes, I would consider it. I guess that's a theme is, uh, is there an opportunity to connect with my reader even in research or investigation reporting if I use those pronouns? Using the pronouns makes the writing sound a lot more natural. Yes, and I would at least consider it. Frank asked about the spaces after the period. Something well, one know. is actually about passive voice. Mm. It just drives me crazy when I read something that says, you know, it was found by. Wait, right. What do you mean? Why don't you just say, I found, or Joe the mechanic reported it, or whatever. That's right. That's right. And this, um, this, you know, the uh, passive sentences are less explicit than active sentences. Sometimes writers choose passive voice on purpose to hide the doer, such as it was decided that we wouldn't hire anyone at this time, even though 10 candidates had been interviewed. That's passive because no one wants to take responsibility there. I prefer active voice and mostly I want people to know the difference and to be able to switch voice active to passive when each voice is called for. Mm -hmm. By the way, Randy, I think, is asking about number 10. He had to step away and he missed what uh, number 10 was. So I thought I'd give you a chance to go. Oh, he didn't know what number 10 was, not referring to the reader as you. Yeah, that's what right. number 10 was. Okay, great. Um, there's a quick question here. Frank asks, any suggestions for writing? Let's see. Oh, okay. Or objectives, yes. You know, um, you know, I mean, how how wrong of me would it be to 
get into such a big topic with two minutes left to go. But <laughs> I would say that uh, good employers with uh, strong HR departments should be helping employees with uh, writing goals and objectives. I don't think this is, it's not fair to turn that task to an employee when the stakes are high because they're going to be reviewed based on those goals or objectives. So I would ask HR for models, for examples, and if you don't get any there, I think it would be um, probably fruitful to turn to an organization called <laughs> SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management, where they, uh, their URL is, I'm pretty sure, shrm.org. They have guidance on writing goals and objectives. That's a high stakes kind of writing for employees. Mm -hmm. So I want to say thank you. It's been great. There's no doubt about it. Indeed. Of course, <laughs> you know, this is my passion and my business. So there's probably <laughs> a part 200. <laughs> so thank you so much. My um, pleasure.